Well, thank you, everyone. I'll go back to my first slide. Um, so I, I appreciate uh, everyone attending. It looks like we've got about 205 people uh, on the line, so uh, it's a good turnout today. Um, first of all, I just wanted to, to point out my blog address. There's SQL Server BI blog. Um, the reason I point that out uh, to you now is because you can contact me through my blog um, as uh, as well as through uh, Solid Q. Um, I'm, I'm also uh, at pturley at solidq.com. You're welcome to reach out to me if you have uh, questions. So what, um, what I'm going to be talking about in this presentation are balancing the, um, the, the, the real tough proposition of understanding business needs, functional requirements, technical requirements, and um, being able to build visual and analytic reports. Um, this has not traditionally been a very easy thing to do. It's, it's something that seems simple on the surface, but um, uh, as we'll talk about, um, it, it can be a bit challenging. And some of you may have uh, experienced some of these challenges. So I thought I'd start out by sharing with you what I've learned through my experience. I've, I've been working with BI and reporting solutions for about 15 years now. And uh, I've worked with literally hundreds of consulting clients, uh, many, many, many different projects. Uh, and so I, th this, is, this is what I believe to be the secret of, of uh, uh, achieving success in reporting projects. So secret number one is find a single stakeholder to articulate all the business requirements. Secret number two is establish all the requirements before beginning work. Document the requirements thoroughly and get sign off. And then give the users exactly what they want, nothing more, nothing less. Now, obviously, these are pretty hard things to do. But time and time again, we often will go into projects really believing that we can get to a single stakeholder, that we can get those requirements and get the users to tell us exactly what they want, document them, not move forward until we have uh, everything, but, but we repeat history. And it's not that easy. It's, it's a very difficult thing to do. And having done this several times, um, I, 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 I can tell you that uh, this is not something that usually happens. So why, you know, we, we, this is the pattern that we typically follow in application development projects or with database projects, other type of BI, or I'm sorry, other types of IT development work. Why is BI so different? Well, reporting and BI projects are chaotic by nature for a number of different reasons. Um, it's just the way it is. Uh, you have to exercise discipline. Uh, I, I love this picture of the, the, the cat with the dogs there. Um, sometimes there are no rules. Now, I, I, the, the, the American audience may appreciate this. This is actually a commercial that, uh, that uh, Little Caesar's Pizza uh, aired um, when they said there are no rules. And so he took off his shirt and, uh, and uh, said, well, there, maybe there are some rules. So, Sometimes there are no rules, only guidelines. Everybody should appreciate the, uh, the guidelines reference here. So when we think about BI, we have to balance two different concepts, two different ends of the spectrum. The first is that in any successful project, we have to take a methodical approach. We have to um, have a specific set of requirements and a specific set of tasks, and then work through the through those tasks and check off the the boxes. Um, but BI is very much an iterative process. Um, it's it's very much a uh, a um, a cycle of planning, designing, prototyping, and validating, and through that process. We're going to consider requirements and prototype features that we may throw away, and we may uh, prototype features that we want to keep. 
And this can be a difficult conversation to have with stakeholders and users who uh, you know, don't, don't want to pay for us to take a lot of time to throw things away. But this is a reality. And so the, the reality in this equation is that, one, it would be great if we could have all the requirements up front. So we could just build that task list and say, there it is. We have 25 requirements. We're going to list them. We're going to work through the process of building out reports. We're going to check off each of these boxes, and then we'll be done with it. Because that rarely happens, because requirements uh, tend to be difficult to define and, and tend to be very nebulous by nature, we, we end up doing these cycles. And this has kind of led the industry to approaches like Agile. Uh, and uh, you know the old Microsoft uh, solutions framework um, iterative process model, um, really realizing that when we go to a set of users and say, "What do you want?" they say, "I don't know. What what can you give us?" Uh, well, let's build something for you, and we'll show it to you, and then you can tell us, you know, if if we're on the right path. That 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 uh, kind of promotes this iterative process. So we have to find the right balance, and that's going to be different in different organizations. Paul, we you did have, have a, I'm sorry, okay, to cool. we ahead. did have a question um, in regards to the business requirements. Yes. The question was, you mentioned to find a single stakeholder to articulate all the business requirements. Is that the BA, not executive champion? And how can one person even know all the requirements? It seems that would be very difficult to gather all that, and it might take several stakeholders. I agree. And uh, so the, the, this statement was meant to be a bit sarcastic. So my, my, my point in this slide is that if we had a single stakeholder who had all the requirements, that would make it easy. But because there is rarely a single stakeholder, it, it's not an easy proposition. So I mean, the, the point is that there isn't a single stakeholder. If we had one, it would be easy. Um, your stakeholders are going to be um, uh, actually. Let me let me let me step up to the slide that I was just on because this actually makes the point. Um, you're going to have different stakeholders um, unless you're building a dashboard solution for one person. You know, if the CEO wants you to build a dashboard that only he or she is going to use. Well, that would be great to have an audience of one person who knows exactly what they want. But typically, that's not the case. So uh, uh, your, your stakeholder may fall into a few different categories. Let me work through this slide, and I'll come back to that question. So understand what your audience needs. So here, here's a line worker. Here's someone who works maybe on the production floor in a manufacturing company. What does that person want? They want something to help them do their job. So if they um, go to a computer screen and need to get information, they, they have a particular task that they're going to perform, and it would be helpful to have something that resonates with them, something that they understand, something that's familiar to them. And so that might be some kind of a visual metaphor, something that's familiar to them. Another stakeholder or set of users might be a, a, a financial person, uh, let's say the company controller. Well, what does that person want? She might say, just show me the numbers. Okay. This is an audience that lives inside probably Excel, and the right report uh, format for that person might simply be a spreadsheet. It might just be numbers. They're going to be less visual. And then we have the executive. So this might be our executive sponsor, stakeholder. Um, what's important to this gentleman? Um, he wants to know what's most important. He doesn't want all of the details. He wants to know how the company is doing. He wants to know uh, where the fires are and where the success factors are. So the kind of thing that's going to, to resonate with this stakeholder visually is something like a scorecard with KPIs. Uh, so here we have some examples of some bar graphs. And um, my rule of thumb for this particular user is that we should be able to visualize data that's readable within five seconds. It should be something that he can look at 
it makes sense. The red, green, yellow is, is a very familiar metaphor. Um, and then having um, targets and actuals that are visualized in this way uh, allows him to see what's going on, but then he may want to drill down. He may want to be able to get to more detail. So back to the original question. Um, since we, we realize that there isn't going to be a single stakeholder, when approaching a VI project, typically, and this is going to be different in different organizations and um, with different types of data and different business cultures, but typically you, you are going to have um, an executive stakeholder. You have somebody who owns the project. That's the person who um, you are responsible to deliver a solution. And if you don't have an executive stakeholder, if you don't have that, that one person who is going to give sign-off, you, you need to get that person. You need to have uh, a specific person who um, ultimately is going to sign off. Now, supporting stakeholders um, may be your financial people, they may be the line-level workers within the organization, um, or, or they, you know, they may be salespeople or, 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 or other um, business organizations. So I think it's important to, to kind of profile that audience and make sure that you understand them and that you have appropriate representation. And then we have an understanding um, that, that, that this person is a designated stakeholder and they're going to attend meetings and you're going to get requirements from them and then you're going to seek uh, sign off from that person. Were there any other questions, Dan? Nope, that was it right now. Thank you very much, Paul. Appreciate it. Another very important factor in visualizing data is user perception and just the concept of visualization. So by a number of different studies, uh, about 65% uh, of people in the world are, are visual thinkers. When they um, perceive information, they usually paint a picture in their head. So you, you, you have the, 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 the analytic thinkers and you have the visual thinkers, and that has a lot to do with the way that a, a person's brain is wired. Now, not everybody is, is, is completely visual and completely analytic. I mean, we play dual roles, we deal with a lot of information these days, and so, you know, people may consume information in a very, very analytic, very numerical fashion at, at one point, and then may consume information in a visual fashion, so that can be situational as well. So, um, two different styles of reports, uh, very simple, traditional, kind of old school report on the left, and then uh, more of a dashboard style, very visual, dressy, um, colorful report on the right. So the factors that are really going to, to um, determine what, what kind of report and what kind of visualization is appropriate are, one, whether a person is left or right brained, um, whether it's an operational or analytic application, and then the business culture is also going to be a big factor. I did a project many years ago for a big um, airplane manufacturer, and I was working with engineers, and they had this old green screen application, and um, they were everything they had was just very textual. It was just very boring in my mind. So the first thing that I did was I converted some of the reports to visual reports. I used charts and graphs and put the, that in front of these engineers, and they immediately dismissed them. They said, we don't do pretty. Pretty is not reliable. So there was a perception question there. And I needed to learn that about that business culture in order to understand that there were just certain types of, of uh, visualizations that weren't going to be acceptable and weren't going to be useful. It's interesting, I, I have two daughters, 17 and 18, and I, I showed this slide to them and I said, what, you know, what do you think of this? And one of my daughters said, Dad, it's very colorful and it's balanced, I like the composition. And the other one said, why are there pens in the beaker? So just an example of two different ways of thinking about things. 
All right. Well, let's let's get to um, actual reporting tools. Now, I, I've been working on different versions of this slide for a long time, and uh, and, and I'm going to expect um, there to be a, a few questions as I work through this slide. So we'll pause uh, at, at various points and 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 talk about these tools. So they're really two different categories of reporting tools that I'm going to address in this slide. One is the desktop tools. These are simply tools that run on the desktop rather than uh, on a server uh, or in the cloud. So, you know, uh, up at the top we have Excel. You can do a lot of great things with Excel. Excel is a very visual tool. Uh, if used correctly, it, it can be a very interactive tool. You've got a lot of charts. You've got a lot of, of different ways that you can visualize data using conditional formatting. You have drill down capabilities and drill through capabilities in pivot tables and pivot charts. Um, we also have add-ons or add-ins for Excel that have been introduced with the Power BI stack in recent years. Um, Power View and then Power Map. Now, in the shared space, in the enterprise or non-desktop space. There are essentially three different platforms for delivering Microsoft-centric BI solutions. And they are, on the left, an on-premises report server, um, essentially installing SQL Server with reporting services that creates a report server. And so you, you have this shared space where you can deliver reports that um, that, that people can share. In the middle, we have the Office 365. We, essentially, we have the cloud, Office 365 or Power BI. And then on the right, you have on-premises SharePoint. So within your organizations or your clients or customers' organizations, there will be opportunities or restrictions here. Um, reporting services is easy because it installs with SQL Server doesn't require any additional software. SharePoint is um, more expensive. It's more, um, uh, it's, it's a lot more work to set up. Um, in order to integrate uh, BI tools with SharePoint, you have to use the Enterprise Edition, and there are some configuration tasks that can be kind of tough. And then we have the cloud in the middle. And uh, everything is moving toward the cloud. If you're, you're hearing, uh, what uh, Satya Nadella is, is uh, marching forward with in the new generation of Microsoft tools, it's cloud first and mobile first. And it's very convenient to use the cloud. It's very, very easy to build reports and build dashboards and, and put them in the cloud so they can be shared. But the question then is, is, you know, is an organization going to do that? Do they trust putting their data out there? Uh, are they okay with people using the internet? To, to do that kind of thing. There are just certain businesses where that's not allowed and certain businesses where it's, it's becoming more acceptable. So let's go through the list of reporting tools that are available in these different platforms. The first is reporting services. So SQL Server reporting services out of the box installs in native mode, which means that you have a report server, you have this web tool called Report Manager, and you develop reports either in the Visual Studio-based Report Designer, SQL Server Data Tools, or uh, Report Builder. And then when you deploy that, it's going to report, deploy it out to a report server where it can be shared and secured. Over on the right side, we have um, on-premises SharePoint. So if reporting services is integrated with SharePoint, now users are having kind of a, a unified experience. They, they, they have their SharePoint documents out there, they have their workflows, they're collaborating. SharePoint is this place where we go to share all of our information. And getting to a report or a dashboard is just a simple matter of going to another library and clicking on an item and then, then we see that report. Uh, and that's a good story today. Now, Excel services, so over on the left we had Excel. Obviously, Excel is a great tool to connect to different data sources. Excel is a, a really, really good tool to use to connect to uh, an analysis services queue or a tabular model. Um, but in a shared environment, Excel services essentially is Excel running on the server. So 
in SharePoint Enterprise uh, with Excel services turned on, you can take an Excel document, you could build an entire dashboard with connectivity to an analysis queue, analysis services queue, or to a SQL Server database, and then load that into a library. And when a user clicks on that document, that opens full screen in the browser, and it's not running in Excel on the browser. Just a lot like you, you, uh, if you put an Excel document up in your OneDrive. Um, and you click on that, it, it doesn't actually open Excel. It renders it on the server, and, and OneDrive actually uses SharePoint. Um, and you're, you're just looking at HTML, and the user doesn't have to have Excel, but then they can optionally edit that in, in Excel. The next tool is PowerView, and Microsoft is putting a lot of effort into this tool. So PowerView was introduced a few years ago um, as Project Crescent uh, based on Silverlight. And um, PowerView is this interactive analytic tool that allows users to simply interact with their data, to simply play with their data, and to ask questions, and to cross-drill, and to, to work with data without having to be a developer or having to write script or write queries. It's a very, very simple interactive tool. Now, the um, caveat to that is that PowerView can only be used with analysis services and or Power Pivot. The reason I say and or is that Power Pivot is actually analysis services, so it's the, it's the same data structure. Um, uh, was there a question? Um, we did have a question, but it was back in regards to reporting services. Okay. Let me finish the slide, and I'll come back then. Perfect. Yeah. Um, so um, what, what to know about PowerView is that it does run on the desktop. So if you have Excel 2013 Pro Plus Edition, you have PowerView. And so you can create a Power Pivot model, then you can use PowerView to interact with that model. Um, in SharePoint, PowerView is is shared, so you can you can take that Excel document that where you've you've uh, uh, created PowerView reports and um, put it out into a library. Typically, you want to use the um, the Power Pivot Gallery, which gives you some nice visualization and navigation features, and um, that creates a collaborative environment where literally hundreds thousands of users would be able to to use that report. In the cloud, Microsoft is, is, isn't necessarily calling this PowerView, but part of the, the Power BI um, offering that is currently in preview, the, the, the Power BI dashboard designer also has this same visual metaphor. We're, we're calling that PowerView uh, as well, at least I am. Um, then we have the Power BI Q&A. And Power BI Q&A is this really, really cool experience where you can have a talk with your data. Um, so if you have um, have saved a, a Power Pivot model um, to uh, the cloud, to Power BI, you uh, simply um, ask questions. So it's a lot like Googling your, your, your data. So you could simply say, um, what what's the total sales amount by state for calendar year 2015? And it would tell you, and then it would visualize that using PowerView. Um, and then finally, we have um, mobility. And mobility right now is being delivered entirely to the cloud. Um, against the Power BI offering, Microsoft has created um, a native uh, Windows tablet application, an iPad application, and an iPhone application. And then, of course, since Power BI renders to, um, to HTML, then it's, it's available in any browser as well. So, Dan, what was the reporting services question? All right. Um, so we have three questions in regards to the tools here. The first one um, is kind of your opinion, I guess. Uh, what grade would you give the reporting services team in terms of growth and support 
of reporting services over the past decade. They said it appears that reporting services has somewhat stalled and is very difficult to use when you have all these different versions of SQL Server in your environment. Wow, that's a good question. <laughs> I'm not quite sure how to answer that. <laughs> and, and I think you know what I mean when I say that. Correct. Um, so, um, yes, you're right. Um, so what's happened to reporting services? Why why are we seeing that, um, you know, in, in, in 2004 when reporting services was released and then on to, oh, what, uh, 2010 or so in that period of six years it was this vibrant product and and we saw features added very aggressively and there was a lot of support and uh, just a lot of excitement and great things happening um, I, I wrote four books on reporting services in that time and it was a product that I was very excited uh, about um, Let's talk about how things work at Microsoft. And I don't think this is exclusive to Microsoft. I think this is just the software business uh, in general. Um, when you have a new product um, that is, is popular, that people are paying for, it gets funding, uh, there's a lot of excitement around it. When the reporting services team was originally organized uh, by Jason Carlson back in 2002, um, it, they, they had 30 people building that product. They worked really hard. They were very proud of what they did. Um, because it was so successful, they uh, doubled. They may have even tripled the size of that team. So Microsoft was putting a lot of money and effort, and they were getting a lot of attention. And um, you know things were, were, were really, really good. There was a shift. And um, uh, we, we, we saw BI and and more sophisticated reporting shift from uh, from a you know everything was reporting services that was great to uh, being based on SharePoint. So we saw a, a lot of hype around tools like Performance Point and Excel services, and so there was kind of a rush to move things into SharePoint and to make that the center of the universe. And that didn't work for everybody. And, and then suddenly there was this big push to, to put everything in the cloud. And then self-service BI came around. So Microsoft acquired um, the original report builder product as their first attempt to create a self-service reporting tool. That had limited success. It, it was a decent tool, but it didn't, didn't serve everybody's needs. Um, they then refactored um, that product and they built what we now know as Report Builder is an attempt, again, to enable end users to build their own reports. Long story short is that suddenly the focus was on enabling the business to do reporting. And the shift went from reporting services, the traditional RDL um, uh, report design tools, to PowerView. Uh, there were staff changes. There were leadership changes at Microsoft. I won't get into a, a lot of that, but you know those things happen. You know, we we went from Bill Gates to Steve, Steve Ballmer to Satya Nadella in a fairly short period of time. Um, as the CEO, we saw a lot of reorganization within Microsoft, a lot of shift in focus because the industry was changing. Anyway, long story short, the reporting services team is not nearly as big as it as it used to be. Uh, they're not getting quite as much love and attention as, as they used to. Um, I think the general perception there is that this is a stable product. It works. Uh, why should we put a lot of um, a lot of resources into changing it and and uh, and improving it if we have a good stable product? Now I think that. Reporting services will eventually evolve. I think it'll get some love again. Um, and that may be uh, a professional reporting extension of something like PowerView that also has operational reporting capabilities, I think. I'm not making any promises. I'm not saying that's the way it's going to be. But um, recently, we within the MVP community have um, seen some evidence, and you be, need to be real careful about this, um, and have seen some 
some indication that there will be uh, traction moving reporting services forward. But in, in response to the question, I, I think that my, my kind of my summary is, yes, you're right. You're, you're, you're seeing the same thing that we're seeing. There are a lot of factors, and, and that's really the way it is because they're working on other things, and Power BI right now is getting all the attention. What's the next question, Dan? Perfect. <laughs> and, uh, and Microsoft has stated that um, they are looking to integrate reporting services in the, the online Power BI as well. Um, yes, they have. They, they have. have. Um, as a follow-up to that reporting services, um, someone is inquiring if uh, Microsoft is wanting to replace reporting services for all the power tools. Well, I, I don't think it's possible to replace reporting services with, with Power BI. Um, I, I, I'm not going to use Power Pivot and Power View to create an invoice report. Um, you know, that, that's what I would use reporting services for. A lot of things that, that uh, reporting services can do that, that uh, a lot of these other more um, self-service reporting tools weren't designed for, like, um, like, like drill through and um, uh, using expressions and programming code to do more sophisticated things within a report. So. I think we have to acknowledge that um, this isn't a matter of replacement. Um, I, I, I think that it's an evolution, and reporting services still has its place, and it's not going away. Well stated. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we had a question about, in regards to the tools here, could you possibly just briefly highlight the tools that you can use without SharePoint or the cloud offerings? Um, well, actually, that's, that, that, that's what this slide is for. If, if you um, just, there's my mouse. Um, so in SharePoint, um, we have Power View that, that is, is shared on premises. We have Excel that is shared on premises. Um, and then you have all of these offerings that require the cloud. Without the cloud or SharePoint, you have reporting services. And then on the desktop, you have uh, Excel-based visuals, PowerView, and PowerMap. And you would still, how would you factor in, like, say, a report builder? Um, when I talk about reporting services, um, that, that encompasses both the uh, Visual Studio-based report designer and report builder. Perfect. Uh, Question about PowerView. Um, does that work with both tabular and multidimensional analysis services? It does now um, within SharePoint. So um, in uh, SharePoint with um, SQL Server 2012, uh, what, what, whatever, I, I forget what service pack that was introduced in, but uh, uh, PowerView will work. Uh, with uh, multi-dimensional now. Um, and I believe that in Office 2016 that Excel, uh, within Excel you'll also be able to consume uh, multi-dimensional uh, analysis services. I'm just looking at the clock and realizing that uh, although this, this slide is really kind of a centerpiece of this presentation, I do need to, to move forward and uh, why don't we do that so we have time for questions at the end. Sounds good. So I'm going to move forward. Um, so um, I, I, this is a slide that I've been using uh, for quite a while. So you, you'll you'll get a taste of, of my 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 somewhat uh, sarcastic personality, um, a, a, as you did before, as I was talking about single stakeholders and getting all requirements before moving forward. But uh, you know, how does this statement make you feel? Microsoft gives me lots of tool choices. It's no doubt that Microsoft have given us a lot of different tools that um, do different things, and some of them do similar things. And it, it can be a, a bit mind-boggling. And, and, and that compounded with the need to have a, a platform that supports that, whether it's report server or the cloud or, or SharePoint. Um, I, I, 
think this is really evidence that within this industry, within software, things evolve, the industry changes, and um, Microsoft, like any other uh, company, is constantly building new software, and they're putting things out there to see if they stick or not. And in the end, we end up with a lot of choices, and it's not necessarily because it was, it was planned that way. Uh, there, there's no conspiracy here. Uh, there, there's no one stepping back and saying, hey, let's just make this confusing. Um, they're, they're really trying to serve their customers, but in doing so, they end up giving us a lot of different tools, and sometimes the choices can be a little confusing. So let's talk about uh, report data sources. Um, so these are generally the data sources that can be used for uh, BI solutions, reports in BI solutions, uh, a relational database such as SQL Server, a multi-dimensional cube analysis services, a tabular cube or a tabular model, which is also part of analysis services, and then power pivot models. Um, but what about all of these these new data sources that we hear about? What about big data, about you know Hadoop and and O data and JSON and XML? Within the Microsoft space, typically when we think about unifying data from all of these disparate data sources, we are either going to use those as data sources for our semantic models. So we build our cubes, tabular models, or power pivot models on top of Hadoop, or on top of Oracle, or on top of an OData feed. And we bring that into a semantic model, and then the report simply consumes the semantic model. Now, if, if, if you're working in the BI space, and you're truly building BI style reporting solutions, dashboards, interactive reports, and you're not using analysis services or Power Pivot today, you need to be. But this is Microsoft's approach. It's to bring everything into a semantic model. So how do we document report requirements? Well, um, I've, I've, uh, I've worked for a few consulting companies, and I've personally developed a number of different uh, report uh, requirement um, templates. And um, what I've found that works the best is to take a very simple approach. So this is actually a, a complete template that we actually use at SolidQ. It's a very, very simple outline of the report. It states the data source, how data is grouped, how it's filtered and parameterized, and it doesn't attempt to break down all of the components of the report. To try to do that, as I did with it in, in another company, where we had a very, very complex and a very, uh, very sophisticated and, and I believe overcomplicated um, requirements back, um, it's just not going to be used. Uh, people just won't take the time to, to write requirements at that level of detail. So keep it simple and uh, you want to have something formal, something that you can you know, build into your, your uh, project documentation assets. It will say, okay, here's here's a request for this report. This is what they wanted, etc. But um, keep it under uh, a few pages, um, so it's non-comprehensive. And then mockups can go a long ways. And these are some actual mockups from one of my clients um, for some dashboard style reports that they wanted. Uh, we essentially sat down with a group of stakeholders and we said. Um, Show us generally what you're thinking. Uh, what you know? What what what's what's in your mind? Let's get that out into a visual form. And the easiest way for them to do that was just to throw some numbers and data into Excel uh, tables and worksheets, and then build some charts and and some visuals on that. And and again, we we want to keep that really simple. And um, let you know, get things out of our users' heads and um, then we can use that as a starting point. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that a pie chart is the best way to visualize certain information. It doesn't necessarily mean that um, you know, the way they've been doing it in the past is the best way, but at least we have a starting point and we can start a discussion. All right, so converting requirements to visuals. There are some very well understood 
uh, rules and structural approaches to taking a, a, a set of data and requirements for reporting on that data and visualizing it. Um, and these are some examples. The first is segmentation. That simply means that um, when the requirement says, I, I, I have a set of data with a measure, and I want to compare categorically this sum of or this average of some value side by side with other categoric um, uh, attributes, that's a, a very simple example of segmentation. It's not a trend, it's not a progression, it's just a category A, category B, category C, et cetera. Now a time series is, is different. We are comparing measure values side by side, but we're seeing how they change over time. And, and sometimes we might even use a, a column chart for, as a time series, just understanding that as you move from left to right, you're moving through time as opposed to just comparing things side by side that don't progress from one state to another. Um, measure to target. This is a very important concept. And I, I find that as I go into organizations all the time, I have conversations with stakeholders, um, they'll say, hey, we want KPIs. You know, we want to see you know, how we're doing. We want you know, red, yellow, green. And I say, well, great, where are your targets? Uh, targets, we don't have targets. Well, you know, uh, do, do you, you operate, you know, based on some kind of goals or, or, uh, or projections or objectives? Well, yeah, but those are in somebody's spreadsheet somewhere. So get those into your model. Get those into your data so that you can measure your actuals against a target or a goal of some kind. And that might take a little bit of a process change to make that happen. Contribution to a whole is really an extension of segmentation. Um, what do you do with deviations and outliers? So what do you do when you have these numbers that are outside the norm? Um, do you dismiss them or do you deal with them visually? And that, that can be um, a challenge and it's something you need to have a conversation about. And then finally, we have geographic analysis. So this is a very simple overview of, of some different visualization options. There's some good guidance out there. There's some great books. Um, from um, Nathan Yao has a couple of really good books on, on visualization, uh, Visualize This and, uh, and Data Points are, are some really good books that he's written. Of course, Stephen Few. Um, uh, I, I, I think that Stephen Few is really kind of the go-to uh, when it comes to um, dashboard design. Which brings us to dashboard design. So, I'm just going to step back and read through this slide because I think this is the best way that I could possibly say what I'm trying to express here. Poor design is painfully obvious. Oh, just come back to this slide. Only after it's finished. So, the natural progression of dashboard design is that we have an idea, we have a concept, it's not fully baked, so we start building things. And so you start throwing things onto this, this dashboard style report, you know, whether that's in Excel or reporting services or Power View, those are all tools that, that we can use to build dashboard style reports. But what we end up with is the kitchen sink. That's a phrase that uh, means a lot of different things, but essentially it's just this big mess. It's just this big heap. We had good intentions. You look at the, the picture on the right, you know, the, the, the motorcycle uh, with all of these different pieces of in instrumentation. Same, same thing. Um, lots of functionality here, not well organized. And this is the way a lot of dashboards tend to evolve. Um, report designers also tend to try to make things really pretty. Um, when I started using reporting services, yes, I used the 3D effects. I used the gradient fills, I used borders, I used uh, you know background colors, and then quickly learned that 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 was all fluff. So we want to make sure that most of the pixels used in a visual are used to visualize the data, not the background, not the 3D effect, not the the the, the fluff, as Edward Tufte would say, but the actual data. 
the, the important stuff. And there's an excellent example of this on the right. This comes from um, one of Stephen Few's examples from his website, The Perceptual Edge. A great dashboard is the product of planning, interactive design, and simplification, and you're never ever going to get it right the first time. So plan to iterate, plan to prototype, and plan to you know, get feedback from your stakeholders. All right. So um, let's go back and, and take some more questions. All right. Um, in regards, if you go back a couple of slides uh, where you're showing the different visualizations, there was a question in regards to your the top right there, the measure to target, and the bottom center, the deviations and outliers. Which tools yeah. today could you use to produce those? Um, we can use we can certainly use reporting services to create a uh, a bullet graph. Um, the 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 gauge component in reporting services is very powerful. There's a lot of flexibility. Um, unfortunately, it um, it takes a lot of work um, to to be able to customize it. Um, so my my answer is reporting services is is the go-to. I understand that we 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 should get um, something like this in PowerView in the in the future. Um, we and you know we don't ever make any promises um, about a product where we haven't actually seen a feature yet. But I know that this is on the short list. Um, so reporting services is what I would typically use within the Microsoft. Um, uh, stack to do that now. I don't know if Excel has that capability. Um, we can certainly do a whisker or um, candlestick chart in reporting services, and and I've built uh, reports like this with uh, with reporting services. Okay. Um, let's see here. What is your preferred mock-up tool, and how do you manage expectations when the mock-up can't be pixel perfect? My favorite mock-up tool is a whiteboard. I think that if we can remove software from the equation at first, that that gets us away from trying to make it perfect. It's more important to um, be able to express the concept and be able to communicate uh, a visual expression of information than it is to you know, build something with software. So that, that, that's where I start. I, I, I unplug. I shut, shut my laptop down and I go to the whiteboard and we just start uh, writing on the whiteboard. Um, y you know, if I need to build some kind of a proof of concept, then I, I'm going to use whatever tool will let me get there as quickly as possible with a very firm understanding that we're not going to let that evolve into production. And that could be Excel or it could be reporting services. I've been using reporting services long enough that I can throw something together very quickly. Um, I, I might even create a SQL database and just throw some numbers into it. Um, but gosh, you know, as, as I think through that question, I'm, I'm thinking, well, you know, but I've used PowerView for that too. So, you know, so, so now, now I've got the whiteboard, Excel, reporting services, and PowerView. Um, and I think it just depends. The goal is to keep it simple, uh, to, to build something that's non-production, that expresses the concept, something you can put in front of somebody, and don't get hung up on making it absolutely perfect. Perfect. I had a couple of inquiries as to whether or not you would be willing or able to share your requirements documentation. Um, the I, I I can't share that document that I used here because it's it's actually owned by Solid Q. <laughs> okay. Um, an inquiry about performance point. They didn't see that on your list. Is performance point being phased out? Uh, it was very deliberately left off the list. Um, I, I can't. I can't speak to whether it's going to be officially deprecated. Um, what I can tell you is that um, we're 
I, we're not hearing anybody at Microsoft talk about performance point uh, as we're um, at the MVP summit and, and at big conference events. Uh, the Microsoft teams aren't talking about performance point. It doesn't seem to be getting a lot of love and attention. Um, my personal opinion is that it's something that is out there in SharePoint they're going to leave out there and probably not make significant improvements to, but it's, it, it's not a product that I enjoy using, and I don't think it's going to be a product that's going to, to uh, see much improvement in the future. So I, I, I personally have taken Performance Point off my list. All right. Um, another question. What do you do when you have several level of decision makers that are a mix of both visual and analytical thinkers? Well, I think it's we're we're trying to strike balance, and um, I, I think it's it's good to have that input. Um, let me let me kind of take that question and that concept of of mixing visuals with with uh, more detailed analytic reporting to to a, another level, and that is if if I recognize a set of requirements where we need to present information in simple visual form, let's say in a dashboard, yet um, we also recognize the need to be able to present more detailed information from the same data source within the same set of data or within the, or, or within the same uh, you know, the business function, um, how do I do that? How, how, how do I meet both of those needs? And, and my answer is, is through report navigation, through um, drill through reporting. What I will typically do is I'll build a dashboard style report with a chart that uh, has the data rolled up at a high level and then I build a second report with the details that support that. And then the user has the ability to click on a bar in the chart. And let's say they've already selected some parameters. So, you know, we've already filtered the data by year. We filtered it by department. Uh, and, and then they're going to click on some kind of category. And that's going to pass those parameters into a second report, a detailed report. And that's going to give them this, this um, more spreadsheet-like set of data in, in greater detail. And we could even take that further and, and have uh, three or four different levels of, of drill through. But, but, but in, in, in my mind, drill through is what it's all about. Not all of the Microsoft tools work to, together to, to provide that level of navigation, but there are some good ways to, to be able to do that. Thinking entirely within reporting services, um, we can build a visual report, a chart, let's say, that drills through to a detailed report, and that, that meets both of those needs. All right, and we are at 12 o'clock. Um, we are out of time. I want to thank you very much for all of your time today, Paul, for taking time out of your day and doing this presentation for the group. It's greatly appreciated. We had an outstanding attendance with well over 200 people. Um, just a reminder that when you do sign off, um, there will be a short survey. If you could please fill that out and give us some feedback. Um, and if you're interested in speaking, uh, definitely make notation of that. Um, we will be going through the attendee list and uh, giving out a $25 Amazon gift card too for, the, for today. And uh, just a reminder that uh, the content is already available on the uh, pass on our BAVC website um, if you go into the event attachments for this presentation. And we will be uploading this recording um, later on today. Thanks again, Paul. Um, any last parting words of wisdom? Um, well, just thank you for the opportunity to speak. It's always a pleasure. Um, please visit my blog. I, I have several presentations like this, and there are several um, more detailed posts on uh, supporting topics um, that will, will take uh, a lot of what I talked about to the next level, all available on my blog. So I just, just recommend that you go there. Thank you, everyone, for attending. I really appreciate it.
Thanks again, Paul. It's been an honor having you today. Thanks again. Take care, everyone. Until next time.